<laughs> so welcome everyone to Voices for Choice, an evening of discussion and action for reproductive justice. My name is Aviva Zadoff and I am the chair of the Reproductive Justice Initiative at NCJW New York and a member of NCJW New York's Advocacy Leadership Committee. So thank you so much to Jofa for co-hosting the event um, with NCJW New York. In particular, thank you to um, Sharon Weiss Greenberg and Shira Ellison for their help in planning and putting together this event. Um, the event is being live streamed on YouTube, on the Jofa um, YouTube channel. So there will be a link afterwards. And um, for anyone who's not able to come that you know of and might be interested, you can send this link and they'll be able to watch it on YouTube. So for those of you who are new to the National Council of Jewish Women in New York, NCJW New York, of volunteers and advocates who turn progressive ideals into action. Inspired by Jewish values, NCJW New York strives for social justice by improving the quality of life for women, children, and families, and by safeguarding individual rights and freedoms. Um, NCJW New York serves New Yorkers from all walks of life, from all racial and religious backgrounds. For more than 120 years, NCJW New York has been fostering women's leadership and addressing the city's inequities with both direct social services and advocacy for systemic change. Um, so I'm involved, as I mentioned, with NCBW New York through the Advocacy Leadership Committee. The ALC is a group of volunteers who are passionate about social justice, who come together to work on advocacy initiatives. Our current initiatives revolve around reproductive justice, combating sex trafficking, and immigrant and refugee um, rights. So tonight we come together to learn more about the current realities in the fight for choice. Living in New York, we often make assumptions about our rights, and we take for granted that we live in a liberal hub. But the truth is that although we are definitely lucky compared to some are other areas of the country, New York can and must do better. Um, and of course, we do not exist in a vacuum. And while tonight we will be focusing on issues specific to New York and actions and policies the actions and policies of the federal government will affect every state, and we need to be vigilant in speaking up and ready to hold New York's politicians responsible for their actions. NCJW New York has a long history of advocacy around women's health, and today we continue to fight for reproductive justice. Reproductive justice is a community organizing method that highlights the need to look at all aspects of women's life in regards to decision making on reproductive issues. The term was originally coined in the United States by organizations that promote the rights of Native women and women of color. And the reproductive justice framework utilizes an intersectional analysis of women's experiences and focuses on changing the structural inequalities that affect women's reproductive health and their ability to control their reproductive lives. Um, reproductive justice attempts to move women's reproductive rights as simply a legal and political debate to incorporate the economic, social, and health factors that impact women's reproductive choice and decision-making ability. And you can find lots more in the handouts that we have all about reproductive justice. So to that end, our evening looks to explore issues of reproductive rights, access to reproductive care, as well as a faith-based perspective as the National Council of Jewish Women New York to take a more holistic approach. So I'd now like to introduce our moderator for the evening. Rabbi Lori Kaufman is the Director of Community Engagement and Learning for Bet Torah in Mount Kisco, New York. Rabbi Kaufman serves on the national board for the National Council of Jewish Women and is on its executive committee and is chair of NCJW uh, Reproductive Justice Initiative. Rabbi Kaufman also serves on the Jewish Theological Care Advisory Committee. And prior to her ordination from the Jewish Theological Seminary or Clinical School in 2010, Rabbi Kaufman spent 19 years working in private equity. So without further ado, I'll hand it off to Rabbi Kaufman. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. Um, I want to start my remarks this evening by telling a story. My story. It's the story of Sarah Tuttle Singer, um, as she published it in the online blog Feller a few years ago. Here's what she has to say. It's no secret why frightened-looking girls walk into the social worker's office on the second floor of the Student Health Center at UC Berkeley. And while I sat there, vaguely nauseous and needing to pee for the third time that hour, I avoided eye contact with the students walking by. After all, 
nice Jewish girls don't get knocked up freshman year of college. She had a warm smile and a firm handshake. She was short and petite, with close cropped curly hair and kind eyes. My mom and I tried not to let that bother me. So, she said once we were seated across from each other, you're pregnant. Yes. These things happen, she said, and it's my job to make sure that you have all the resources you need to make your decision. I've already made my decision. And, she asked, her face neutral as the beige walls, I'm not ready to have a baby. Okay, well, we're here to support any decision you make, she said, reaching for the stack of brochures to her right on the desk. Here's a list of outside doctors you can contact, she added, as I took the pamphlet. Do you have SHIPP insurance, she asked, referring to the student health insurance plan that most students opt into when they enroll each semester? I nodded. Good. That will cover some of the cost, but you need to come up with another $250. I gulped. It's actually quite reasonable, she said, when she saw my baleful expression. I had no idea what the going rate was, but $250 seemed like a staggering figure. At that moment, I had a grand total of $12.97 to tide me over until December 1st. And I knew asking my parents for money would break their hearts. Hypothetically speaking, what if someone doesn't have enough money, I asked. The social worker looked at me, her eyes alighting on the Jewish star necklace I was wearing. Are you Jewish, she asked. I nodded. My face flushed, and I looked down at my shaking hands. I taught Hebrew school at my synagogue. I received the rabbi's scholarship for outstanding work in the Jewish community. I kept kosher, and I was 19 and pregnant. Okay, that's good, because there's a philanthropic Jewish women's group that offers scholarships of $250 to help cover the costs. Would you be interested in that sort of thing? I wondered if I'd have to write an essay or give them my SAT scores or show them my bat mitzvah certificate. How would I qualify? By being pregnant and not wanting to be pregnant. And by being Jewish, she replied. Look, I'll contact the president of the organization and I can have a check made out to you by the end of the week. Sound good? It sounded great. And not just because I had found a way to finance my abortion, but because for the first time since I found out I was pregnant, I realized I was not the first, nor would I be the last, knocked up, nice Jewish girl. Look, I know some of you will not agree with my decision. In fact, some of you will be sickened by it. But I did what many other 19-year-old girls would do. I chose to stay in school. I chose to teach Hebrew on Sundays and Wednesdays. I chose parties at Hillel and ZBT and dating and weekends with friends. And I chose not to bring an unwanted child into the world. And there are a thousand reasons why I do not regret my decision to have an abortion my freshman year. And I'm grateful I was able to make that choice in a safe way. So Sarah had good reason to feel grateful. She had access to safe medical care. She had health insurance to cover much of the cost and access to a resource, a Jewish one, to help her defray the rest of the cost. Many, many, many women in this country are not as lucky as Sarah. For many pregnant women, the cost of an abortion is often more than she can afford on her own. And a recent study showed that more than half of the women who receive an abortion their out-of-pocket costs are equivalent to more than one-third of their monthly personal income. And that doesn't speak to the challenge of actually finding a place to access abortion care, something which is becoming increasingly difficult and disproportionately impacts low-income women. <clears throat> this is due to the fact that over 300 new anti-abortion restrictions have been put in place over the last six years, primarily at the state level. Since 2001, at least 162 abortion providers have shut or stopped offering the procedure. At no time since 1973, when the US Supreme Court legalized abortion, has a woman's ability to terminate pregnancy been more dependent on her zip code and her financial resources to travel. And it's not just abortion access at risk right now. With the recent happenings in Washington and the House's passage 
of the American Health Care Act of 2017, so-called, low-income women are also now at risk for losing access to affordable birth control coverage, and defunding Planned Parenthood would deny basic health care for two and a half million dollars, which I'm sure we'll hear, two and a half million people, which I'm sure we'll hear more about from states, from Dr. DeLynn. Or to quote Gail Collins from last week's Week in Review, Trump is working toward a world where low-income women won't be able to afford contraceptives and aren't allowed to have an abortion if they get pregnant, where there's no Planned Parenthood to go for help or insurance to cover prenatal care or delivery. And that's what we're here to talk about tonight with our fabulous panel. So first I'd like to introduce Emily Kadar, and she's going to talk about what's happening here in New York. Emily is the Government Affairs and Advocacy Manager at the National Institute for Reproductive Health and the NIRH Action Fund. In that role, she lobbies for proactive pro-choice policy in New York State and City and manages the organization's electoral activity. Prior to joining the National Institute in 2012, Emily was part of the federal government relations team at the Center for Reproductive Rights and organized young activists as the national campus organizer at the Feminist Majority Foundation. Emily. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and thank you all for spending your evening here listening to all of us. I really appreciate it. And it's been um, overwhelming to see how much interest and passion people have for this particular topic. Um, as Rabbi Kaufman mentioned, um, over the past five years, we have seen a surge of anti-choice legislation at the state level. Um, and after in November, when um, I think those of us who have been active working in the abortion rights movement, while we were all shell-shocked, there was also a feeling of like, yeah, this been happening. We've We've seen this, um, and we've seen really the, the conservative backlash, if you want to call it that, um, growing in power over the last five years. Um, so that said, in New York State, we are relatively fortunate in that we have not seen those kinds of strident uh, abortion restrictions enacted here. We have not seen things like 24-hour uh, waiting periods for abortion or um, things that require doctors to recite scripts that contain information that is not just inaccurate, but like outright lies about abortion, the kinds of things that we've seen um, in other states. Um, but we do have a real issue here in New York State. Um, I think a lot of people assume like New York is totally fine. We are good. Um, but New York's abortion law is extremely outdated. So does, can someone tell me what year Roe v. Wade happened? 73. 73. Yeah, shout out. 73. Um, does anyone know when New York State's abortion law passed? 71. 70. 70. Yes. So, come on, you don't, know, <laughs> you don't know New York State legislative history? Yet? <laughs> Top of your head? Um, yes, yeah, so New York's abortion law passed in 1970, which is like, Go us. As, as per usual, New Yorkers are leading the charge, um, which is incredible. But our abortion law has now not been touched since 1970. It was 47 years ago. Um, and that has led to some significant problems with our law. Uh, I'll just kind of lay out what they are. Um, one, our law at the time was a decriminalization because abortion had been illegal. So abortion law in New York resides in the criminal code and not in the health code. So there's literally a heading in New York state law that says murder and abortion. And that's where our law lives. And so as we all know here, hopefully, abortion is a healthcare service. It is a necessary part of reproductive health care. And it should be governed as a healthcare service. But instead, it still resides in that criminal code. And that puts abortion providers at some risk for criminal prosecution. That does not necessarily happen, um, but it's something that should be rectified. Also, uh, Roe v. Wade, the standard of Roe v. Wade includes um, 
a health exception. So after a certain point in pregnancy, while abortion is no longer permitted, there is an exception for the life and the health of a pregnant individual. But in New York State law, there's only an exception for life. So when someone's health is in some danger, but it's not necessarily considered fully life-threatening, an individual might not be able to access an abortion that she needs because a hospital might not feel comfortable permitting their uh, physician from performing that abortion because it's like occupying a weird gray area. A lot of our problems with our law are like these creations of gray areas. Um, and we have seen women having to go out of state to get abortion care. There was an incredible, I don't know if any of you read, um, about a year ago, Jezebel published an incredible story about uh, a couple that had had a very wanted pregnancy. There was a uh, significant fetal anomaly late in the pregnancy. Um, they were patients at Mount Sinai, and they were not able to get an abortion in New York City at one of the greatest hospitals, not just in the city, but I would say in the country. And they actually had to fly to Colorado in order to receive care when she was like 30 weeks pregnant. She had to fly across the country in order to obtain an abortion. Um, and there's a lot of stories like that. If you go to the New York Civil Liberties Union, put out a great report that I recommend everyone check out if you're interested in learning more about this. You can go to nyclu.org and they have this report of women who have had to seek abortion care outside of New York State because our law does not adequately protect them or the healthcare providers who are providing abortions. Um, and then finally, we have a, um, because the law is older, it only talks about physicians as abortion providers. And there are all sorts of healthcare providers operating within their scope of practice who provide abortions here in New York State. Nurse practitioners, uh, midwives, um, physician's assistants in some cases, um, and they've been able to provide that care through kind of a patchwork of different kinds of like opinions and regulations, but as advocates, we believe that they should be fully protected and written into the law, and that the law should not just be about physicians. So those are three significant problems with our abortion law, and you may be sitting there thinking like, okay, these seem fairly small. We should be able to just like quickly take care of that and clean up our law and then we'll be good. Um, and you would think that, except it is incredibly hard for us to fix our abortion law here in New York State. Um, we have been trying to do so for a really long time. Some of you may have been involved with um, this fight, whether it was through fighting for the Reproductive Health Act, the Women's Equality Act, that was a few years ago. Um, we are unable to pass the Reproductive Health Act, which is the bill that would fix all these problems, through the New York State Senate. In fact, we can't even get it onto the floor for a vote. We can't get it through committee. And it's because New York State, while we have a pro-choice governor and a pro-choice state assembly, which passes this bill again and again, they passed it back in January, um, the New York State Senate is controlled by an anti-choice majority. And I'm going to try really hard to keep all of my language super nonpartisan. And I feel like you'll all understand what I'm saying. Um, because our state Senate is controlled by this anti choice majority, which is made part by a deal between the Independent Democratic Conference, which is a breakaway group of eight Democrats. Who, caught, who are all pro progressive and pro-choice, who are all co-sponsors of the Reproductive Health Act, but they caucus with the Republicans, none of whom have signed on to support this bill. Uh, that majority is able to decide what bills get, in, get sent to the floor, and they control things like committee chairs, um, the majorities and committees, all of those things. So this bill just cannot move. And we've been working really hard, um, us, the folks at Planned Parenthood, New York Civil Liberties Union, but also a ton of like amazing grassroots organizations, especially those that have popped up, um, some in the recent months, some that have been working for a longer time, 
um, have been really fighting for this bill and we're going to continue fighting for it. But that has been the biggest challenge here in New York State is that, you know, Roe v. Wade is at risk. I feel like we've said that for a long time. Like, <laughs> like I, I feel a little bit like the girl who cried wolf. Like, we've always been like, Roe v. Wade's at risk, Roe v. Wade's at risk. But right now, the Supreme Court is in a really scary position. And should anything happen to Roe v. Wade, we want to make sure that New York State law is as secure and watertight as it can possibly be. Um, we also know that as other states restrict abortion, those patients, they already come to us. I'm sure you see patients from out of state all the time. Um, and so we want to make sure that our state is a secure, safe place for women and pregnant people all over the country because they're going to come here and we want to make sure that they're safe and protected. Um, so that's the situation in New York. I will stop talking because I feel like you'll hear more from me later, but that, that's where we're at right now. Um, thank you, Emily. And that reminds me, um, everyone should have uh, cards and a uh, pen at their at their seat. We're going to ask you if you have questions to write them down. Um, so you can write them down. If you like me, you forget everything if you don't write them right away. So you can write them down and then we'll collect them at the end of the, the talk and we'll do a Q&A afterwards. Um, so next I want to introduce Dr. Stacey DeLynn, who's actually um, a, doing in, like in the trenches in this work. Um, she's a board certified physician and associate director at Planned Parenthood of New York City, where she specializes in family planning and full spectrum reproductive health care. She's a graduate of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine um, residency program um, at Mount Sinai Beth Israel and is a physician for reproductive health fellow. So, Dr. Dwim. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you guys for coming. Um, I, I'm really uh, happy to be here and to be able to we have so much legal expertise and uh, to be able to just talk about what my experiences are as a physician um, from the medical side. So um, I was invited to do this event through Physicians for Reproductive Health, which is um, um, an organization of reproductive health doctors who perform abortions around the country. There are not that many of us, especially, you know, so many clinics uh, close now, very, very few of us who do the work that I do. but. One of the things that I do is is I speak about my perspective about what it's like to be able to practice abortion in New York State um, and uh, how my experience as a doctor is very different than the experiences of many of my colleagues um, around the country who practice dramatically differently. And there's really no other medical specialty in which if you're a gastroenterologist in New York, you practice the same as a gastroenterologist in Kansas. Um, and for my field, it doesn't apply in how very restricted uh, that many of my colleagues are in ways that I am not. Um, so um, as uh, you mentioned, there have been more than 300 restrictions that have happened just in the last uh, five years. And so that's dramatically changed the landscape of how um, patients are able to access care and doctors are able to practice. So um, some of the things that uh, occur in other states that don't occur here, one thing that's come is something called trap laws, which these are um, legislation about how wide your hallways are or how large your sinks are and uh, abortion is uh, the safest uh, medical procedure that's done with the lowest risk of complications um, compared to anything else and yet there are all these restrictions in which small clinics in many parts of the country are, are not able to install hospital-like measures uh, in their clinics and so um, for example in Texas there are now uh, five remaining clinics uh, hundreds of miles between clinics and uh, we're now at a medical conference I just went to, uh, we have enough data on the women who are trying to self-induce abortions at home that we're able to study it because it's, it's occurring so so much in Texas and a number of other southern states. Um, there are um, restrictions that uh, that there are long waiting periods, which uh, primarily impact um, for uh, poor women in, in Texas, for example, as well. As a physician, uh, you have to be the physician who performs the ultrasound uh, a week before the procedure, meaning that if you're going to be a physician who travels there, um, as some of my colleagues do, you have to be able to give a week of your time. So it's very uh, deliberate. There are uh, uh, bans based on the number of weeks gestation, which is not founded in any science, but often arbitrarily picked. Um, uh, things like uh, admitting privileges that you must have to hospitals. And it's not just the southern states like Texas. Um, so as you mentioned, we do have patients who come and, and I see a lot of patients from Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania actually, I don't know, I tend to think of Pennsylvania as like Philadelphia, but, mm -hmm. but Pennsylvania actually uh, is, has a very uh, conservative state government with a lot of restrictions. So the number one 
uh, restriction that, that I see is, is parental consent. So um, minors have to get uh, permission from their parents in Pennsylvania. And if they can't get it, they would have to go to court and apply for, you know, uh, apply for a judge to give them permission. And so what they do is they drive, uh, they drive to New York. And so we see, um, we see a lot of uh, patients who don't feel like they're able to speak to their parents about their choices. Um, they also have 24 hour waiting periods. Additionally, in Pennsylvania, um, I have a colleague who works there and she has to read something to her patients before she performs abortion. She says, I'm going to read something to you now that I know medically not to be true, but the state requires me to tell you that this procedure will give you breast cancer and will cause you depression and may lead to suicidality. And so um, I, as a physician who's, who's practice in New York and only, I, I, I can't imagine how difficult that is and how difficult it must be for patients to hear. And so, um, so when it comes to the Reproductive Health Act, it just, um, it really, um, we just need to focus on making New York a safe state because, uh, as I mentioned, so many restrictions recently, they're only going to continue to increase. And I know Roe versus Wade is the thing that we all worry about overturning, but it's, it's really already happened in a lot of states. A lot of states, unless you are wealthy, you are unable to access um, the care that you need. Unless you are able to take many days off of work, travel long distances, secure childcare for yourself, all those things, um, you know, there's a, there's a huge disparity of care. And so I think we're gonna continue to see more of it. Um, so that's why we need to really focus on making New York um, a haven for a lot of patients. That said, as you mentioned, there are some, there are some problems with New York. And so one is that we have a, a 24 week ban, which is often called the viability ban, and it, it's something that, at a glance, makes sense. Like, yes, of course, if, if a fetus could be viable, why why would you want to perform an abortion? But as these things come up in the case of the health of the mother, I have, um, you know, colleagues who uh, work in hospitals and have had women admitted with pregnancies that, that can be potentially, you know, that could kill them, and the doctors sort of are in this gray area where they have to wait and say, you know, I don't know if you're sick enough that I wouldn't get in trouble, you know, that it, I couldn't possibly potentially be prosecuted for saving your life. Or on that on the time in which often later gestational ages is when we find things on ultrasound that show lethal fetal anomalies. And unless you are like the patient you mentioned who wrote, unless you have the resources, I think that patient said that it cost her $10,000 uh, just for the procedure in Colorado and she could afford to fly and everything else. That what that means is to find out at, at 30 weeks gestation, as that patient was, if you had a lethal fetal anomaly that you would die, it would mean that you would have to just wait another couple months and carry that pregnancy to term and how devastating that is. And that is really a decision that needs to be made between a woman and her doctor. And so, you know, uh, there's no other, there's no other field of medicine in which, um, you know, doctors are checking the laws. Actually, there's one, which is a really interesting one. Pediatricians in Florida cannot uh, talk, cannot ask their, uh, their patients if there's a gun in the home. There was like a gun lobby <laughs> <laughs> law that was passed. Oh, that was <laughs> <if> <laughs> But besides yeah. that, uh, yeah, it's 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 very um, uh, it's it's very uh, you know I, I went to medical school to learn uh, what was how to um, determine what the best thing was for my patient for their health and their well being. So it's a really um, it's a really difficult place to be in when you have to think uh, legally what the latest politicians have decided on what's what's best for for our patients. Um, and so uh, yeah, so I think. Definitely moving it um, from the criminal code to the health code is an important part of, of the legislation. I want to talk a little bit too about the Contraceptive Care Coverage Act. Um, but we can't really talk about any of this without the setting of the new AHCA and what this is going to mean for everyone. Um, so just a couple of pieces of data, like 24 million people will be removed from insurance, no coverage of pre-existing conditions. And so, so what some of those things are, are if you are pregnant or have been pregnant, that could be considered a pre-existing condition in which it could be denied insurance if you've experienced postpartum depression. Um, if you sought treatment for sexual assault, there was a, a story of a woman who had been sexually assaulted, had received um, uh, HIV medication as a preventive uh, post-exposure prophylaxis, and uh, she was told by an insurance company before the Affordable Care Act came in that they wouldn't cover her because she had a history of being, they wouldn't pick her up because she had been on a history of having HIV uh, medication. So the Affordable Care Act got rid of that provision. Those sorts of things could no longer happen. And uh, now we, uh, the, the current legislation that was passed by the House does not, would remove that, that pre-existing condition. Contraception, of course, would no longer be covered. Um, and we knew, we now have, uh, 
uh, a mandate in which all contraception is covered. And what's really interesting is I was looking at some data from this. Since Trump was elected, we had a 53% increase in, of women asking for long active, oh. long acting uh, reversible contraception, things like IUDs and implants because women are worried, I really better get on something quick. We also have had patients who, for an example, the marine IED, which is common, lasts for seven years, and a paragard, a copper one, lasts for 12 years. And we've had women coming in saying, I know I'm, my time isn't up yet. I've only had it for three years, but in case this gets taken away from me, can you please put this in earlier? And my medical advice is, well, you don't really need to, but I can't, I can't tell them no, because I'm not sure if that's going to be there. And if they say, I really am not going to be able to afford a $1,200 IUD next year, if this happens, can you replace it for me? That's what I've been doing because it's such an uncertain situation. And so... Um, the other things in the CCCA are that, um, you know, that there will be all types covered, that there will be 12 months of contraception access. So uh, long acting methods are, are a great option, but for some women, uh, something like the birth control pill, uh, they might find that better for them. However, currently you're not able to, you have to go every month to the pharmacy. Life can get in the way that's difficult. And so the CCCA would allow a 12 month uh, dispension and would also allow pharmacists to be able to fill emergency contraception uh, under insurance. So now I'm able to, if a patient comes to me in clinic, I can dispense a prescription, which they can go and then have insurance fill it. But if they don't want to come to me, they can buy it off of the counter, but it's, it's very expensive. So a lot of women can't. So this is another part in which uh, I, as a doctor, am happy to say, I don't need to write that prescription. Women know when they, you know, need plan B or, or um, emergency contraception. And so, um, so yeah, so there's a lot in this that I think as we continue to um, be the sort of leader here in New York, as things get a little bit crazier in the rest of the country, you know, these are things to push for. So um, I also, on the way out, I put little cards uh, from Planned Parenthood. There's a, there's a card with a little website address. It's a petition for both of these acts that I mentioned. And uh, if you could, if you would just go onto our website, sign the petition, uh, a bunch of folks from Planned Parenthood are gonna be ringing up to Albany in a few weeks. And uh, all of your voices are really important. And I really appreciate all of you guys being here. And being supportive. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, there's a there's a, a Jewish expression, you know, the, um, the last is the most dearest, actually. So I don't have her own company. So um, so um, Rabbi Lila Kajdan um, is uh, the first Orthodox woman to adopt the title of Rabbi. Rabbi Kajdan holds degrees and certificates from the Midrash at, from Midrash at Lindenbaum, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, the University of Toronto, Harvard University, the MedStar Washington Hospital Center and Massachusetts General Hospital, and is a Shalom Hartman Institute RLI Fellow. She's also a Hadassah Brandeis Institute Gender, Culture, Religion, and Law Research Associate. She was ordained in 2015 by Yeshivat Maharat, and in early 2016, assumed a post at the New Jersey Orthodox Synagogue Mount Freedom Jewish Center. She's now the senior rabbi of the Walnut Street Synagogue in Chelsea, Massachusetts, Massachusetts, and is also the founder of the Sulam School in Brooklyn, Massachusetts. Rabbi Kajdan is an instructor of bioethics at the New York Medical College and is a clinical ethicist as well as a chaplain in hospitals and hospices. Um, I hate the you know, underqualified people. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you for all of your uh, all of your words. Uh, this evening. Um, I'm going to share today some thoughts uh, and information that reflect my uh, my background as an Orthodox rabbi and also as a bioethicist. And uh, this is sort of the legal fine print component uh, of the evening. And, um, and so we'll just go through some of the Jewish concepts. The, the truth of the matter is the Jewish voice in, uh, in this dialogue when it comes to um, uh, this conversation is a very necessary one. I remember when I was uh, starting graduate school in uh, the study of bioethics, I had the opportunity as a part of the Boston Theological Institute to take some courses at other schools of theology. And I actually took a bioethics course at a Jesuit school of theology. And um, when I walked into the course, the first uh, lecture was actually about abortion. And I remember uh, I left the lecture and I called my late father and I said, Abba, Judaism is progressive, <laughs> which is not something I say often. Um, so uh, it, it is just a, an important time for, uh, I think, the Jewish perspective to be here. Actually, Jewish women uh, throughout history have been very much involved in the feminist movement, and, uh, and it's uh, certainly a place that we uh, 
our voices are needed uh, to this day. Uh, I'm gonna reflect a bit on concepts relating to procreation, contraception, and abortion from a Jewish uh, legal halachic perspective. And uh, there's really no one specific answer. I think that's uh, important to be said here. And um, these are very deeply nuanced issues and individuals uh, really ought to consult uh, their physicians first and foremost and, um, and their personal clergy of making decisions with uh, religion in mind because reproductive justice uh, and uh, Judaism is, is really not a one size fits all. Um, I'll, I'll just begin by saying, as some of you may know, there's a tremendous amount of both uh, pressure and also uh, encouragement to reproduce in the Jewish tradition. And, uh, and of course, this comes from the uh, verse in the Torah. Does anybody know which one it is? Be fruitful and multiply. So there is this obligation in Judaism to be fruitful and multiply. Interestingly, the obligation uh, is obligated to whom specifically? Men. Men, actually, right? Men uh, specifically are obligated in, in fruit or boo and being fruitful and multiplying. And um, there are several opinions about why it is that men uh, are obligated and women are not obligated. Uh, but one of the reasons, uh, which is uh, interpreted by Rabbi uh, Meir Semcha of Devinsk in 1920, is as follows uh, Regarding women who are in danger during pregnancy and childbirth, the Torah did not obligate them to procreate. And thus it is permitted for them to take a medicine which will make them sterile, as we find in the case of Yehudit, the wife of Rabbi Hanina, in Yavamot, in the tractate of Yavamot. So uh, it is true that men are obligated to procreate, and, and perhaps one of the reasons that women are not obligated to procreate is actually uh, because of women's health, or because of a maintenance of women's health. So while being fruitful and multiplying is an, an ultimate value, an ultimate uh, goal, it is suspended should a woman's life uh, be in danger, and the, that category and that definition of what it is to actually be in danger uh, is really up for interpretation. Uh, there's not there's not one definition of what it actually might mean to uh, be in danger. So uh, this ultimate value of the safety of the mother is something that Jewish tradition uh, holds very uh, very dear. Now uh, in Yevamot, in the tractate of Yevamot in the Talmud, we read that there are three categories of women who may use what is defined as an absorbent, which is probably some kind of a, a birth control method um, in their marital intercourse. And it's specifically a minor, a pregnant woman, and a nursing woman. These are the three categories. The minor, because otherwise she might become pregnant and as a result might die. A pregnant woman, because otherwise she might cause her fetus to degenerate. And a nursing woman, because otherwise she might have to wean her child prematurely, and this would result in their death. So what are some common themes here among these three categories? Any ideas? Avoidance of death. Avoidance of death. <laughs> mm -hmm. Whose death? Children. Both, right? Depending on their category, the women and uh, and the fetus as well. And in fact, this is the two, these are the two categories that we make these decisions based on um, when it comes to this perspective of Jewish bioethics and halacha, uh, Jewish law, the idea of the health of the mother, um, and also uh, bearing in mind the fetus, but we'll get to that uh, in a moment. Uh, so certainly contraception is uh, something that is sanctioned, that is allowed within the Jewish tradition under different <coughs> circumstances. Uh, this falls under one of those that consult your local um, rabbi um, when it comes to questions about contraception, but certainly Judaism is not uh, a faith tradition that says no to contraception whatsoever. There are some uh, suggestions about different methods of contraception. Uh, again, not a one size fits all. Uh, when it comes to abortion specifically, uh, there are a few guidelines and a few guiding principles uh, in the Jewish tradition when it comes to abortion. So a woman's life, her pain, and her concern uh, take precedence over the life of the fetus. And this might be familiar uh, to several of you who have uh, thought or studied uh, Jewish uh, tradition and uh, the ways in which Jewish tradition approaches abortion. Uh, existing life is always sacred and takes precedence over a potential life. So this is an important distinction that the Jewish faith tradition uh, takes very seriously. And actually this is uh, repeated throughout every conversation regarding abortion 
uh, really in Jewish uh, thought and in Jewish text. Uh, a woman has the personal freedom to apply the principles of her tradition, unfettered by the legal imposition of moral standards other than her own. In other words, her own personal health and the maintenance of her health is of paramount importance. Um, according to Jewish law, a fetus is not recognized as a full human being and therefore has no uh, juridical personality of its own. Uh, the, one of the first mentions of the conversation regarding abortion in Jewish law comes from the book of Exodus and Shmot. Uh, does anybody uh, have any idea where that might, what that might say in Shmot? Uh, it's a sort of an unusual introduction to this concept, but specifically it is regarding a conflict. Uh, if men strive together and hurt a woman with child, so if a, a pregnant woman is injured so that her fruit departs, such that she miscarries, uh, and yet no harm follow, he shall surely be fined according uh, as the woman's husband shall lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judge, judges determine. Um, and, but if any harm follow, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. So in this case, the status of the fetus is an interesting one because of what? Its, its status is connected to the mother, but its status has uh, a certain kind of monetary value. It almost has a value in its own right of the potentiality. Um, so this is a first conversation is about really compensation um, for, a, for a fetal loss. And this is really one of the, the first introductions to this concept uh, and the discussion around abortion. So Jewish law is, is really quite clear. While the fetus uh, in the womb is to be protected, uh, as a potential human being, it has no personhood. That's an important distinction. Um, and therefore, it is not accorded any rights or privileges as a human being. Uh, there are several definitions of what it is to be human. I teach um, medical students at New York Medical College, and we just devoted, we went off topic, and we devoted an entire lecture two weeks ago just to that idea of what is human, how do we define human? Well, the Torah has been trying to do this, um, and several of these conversations uh, very much uh, exist in the Torah. And when it comes to discussions around abortion, some of those uh, attempts at definitions of terms happens uh, to be around the issue of insolvent the time in which the soul enters uh, enters the body. Uh, there are many discussions in Jewish text around insolment, and, and some of those come up in these conversations about abortion. Uh, it's a longer conversation. I hope you'll invite me back to have those conversations. Um, but in the meantime, uh, halacha, Jewish uh, law, the Jewish uh, legal framework, or really the living out of Jewish life, um, has identified um, indications for induced abortions. And it can really be, as I already mentioned, divided into two categories, maternal and fetal. So for the maternal indications for abortion, um, it goes as follows, and, and, and truly it's quite, it's quite straightforward. If the mother's life is endangered as a result of pregnancy or delivery, the mother's life is endangered by disease predating the pregnancy, which is exacerbated by it. Uh, a maternal systemic organic disease exacerb exacerbated by pregnancy, but not life-threatening. Hastening of maternal death as a result of pregnancy, maternal mental disease caused or exacerbated by pregnancy, organic disease of an isolated organ exacerbated by pregnancy, extramarital pregnancy, social, economic, or other factors. And for the fetus-related uh, reasons for abortion, maternal disease is likely to cause fetal defects and um, genetic diseases specifically of the fetus. So if you think about those categories, they're quite inclusive. Uh, and each one of those categories, according to the halakhic framework, are also up for exploration. Um, now, I'll just I'll just add, and obviously this is an al regal and an on one foot kind of conversation about these topics. Uh, all of these topics can be delved into in much greater detail. Uh, certainly, these are uh, topics that I've spent uh, much of my uh, life already studying. Um, for Judaism, the evidence in matters of abortion are, are quite clear. The legal codes and the rabbinic teachings tend to depict the fetus as a part of the woman's body. And uh, just as one may not wantonly mutilate one's own body, so too a woman is not permitted to obtain an abortion um, in a sort of, as the rabbis would describe, as a, as a way where they haven't given some thought to it. You might have heard, and the New York Times has been picking this up a lot lately, these um, uh, abortion tribunals in Israeli hospitals. Has anybody heard about them? Where, uh, if, actually, in Israel, uh, the, the laws surrounding abortion are, um, are very accessible to women. And 
uh, women need to uh, go to a sort of tribunal to uh, to petition for an abortion. Um, I've sat in some of these tribunals. Um, they, they feel much more comfortable that are depicted, I think, in some of these articles. Um, but uh, it's a way to have some, creating some time of, of thought uh, for the woman, as if a woman is not getting this thought before. <laughs> um, um, but this is something that Jewish uh, law has given uh, some thought to, some, some discussion and some thought of the seriousness of it. Uh, one final point is that uh, across all Jewish denominations, uh, I would say, uh, almost all Jewish denominations uh, are on record opposing any governmental regulation of abortion. And um, I would say, begadol, in the big picture, largely, Jews don't love it when the government gets involved in their practice and their Judaism um, and their expression. And um, so whatever their uh, individual opinions might be about abortion, in any given situation, I would say the vast majority of Jewish thinkers agree that decision making with respect to abortion must be left in the hands of, of women and, um, and their physicians. Uh, this is uh, something that I, I think is, is actually quite powerful and uh, about the Jewish faith and um, is something that, uh, that frankly we ought to feel uh, quite grateful for. Um, so again, uh, I would say this is this ought to be the beginning of the conversation, but just uh, at least a small uh, taste of, uh, of some of these thoughts. Um, so before I ask for questions, I just want to sort of um, well obviously thank the panel, so I'll thank them again. But I wanted to just bring it back to um, actually something that Rabbi Kajdan just said, and um, and, and to, to sort of my own personal reasons for getting involved in this work. So um, why do I care about this work as a, as a Jew, as a rabbi, as a mother, as a woman? Um, I care first because it is about religious freedom. The decision about whether and when to become a parent is one of the holiest decisions a person can make. And everyone should have the ability to make that decision according to their own religious beliefs in consultation with their own religious authorities. As you heard, the Jewish perspective is very different than the Christian perspective, and the Christian perspective is one that gets sort of enforced upon us by the politicians. The First Amendment of the United States Constitution prohibits the making of any law that impedes the free exercise of religion. And current abortion restrictions erode this principle by imposing one religious point of view on all people, infringing on our religious liberty. Um, it's, not, it's just not the place of politicians to, in, to impose their religious beliefs on what we should do, period. Next, as a Jew, I believe the Jewish values compel me to work, to protect the dignity and ensure fair treatment of all people because all of us are made in the image of God, B'Tselem Elohim. So people who have fewer accesses to resources shouldn't have inferior access to health care. That is just not just. And we are commanded to pursue a just society for all. In fact, we're commanded to pursue a just society specifically to protect the marginalized in our communities. And it's the marginalized who have to go to other states, who can't afford you know, what they need to do, that are doing the self-induced abortions. Um, it's our job to protect those marginalized people. Nobody should be forced to choose between their health and their economic security. That's not only unjust, it's not only not Jewish, it's just simply immoral. So I'd like now to um, collect questions. And we can have the panelists answer any questions you have. Great, Aviva's coming around. You can start with. Okay, great. They can try to make sense of it. I can clarify. Okay, great. Um, so there have been a couple of questions about um, with the New York 
would the provisions of the New York mm -hmm. State um, CCCA override Trump care? So, like, like well, I guess there's this questions about like what's happening nationally versus locally and the tension between the two. So, Emily, that feels like one. Yeah, you know. I can try my best. Um, I have colleagues who are like way better at all of this than I am. Who like, no one understands? Yeah, <laughs> right. that's the other thing. Is, yeah. Um, so yeah. So in terms of um, for contraception specifically. Uh, because insurance is generally governed at a state level, um, it's like the federal government kind of creates uh, like a floor and then states can build upon it. So in New York, we already have some things that other places don't have. So like, for instance, you can use Medicaid to cover the cost of abortions here in New York State. You can even enroll in Medicaid when you first find out you're pregnant. That's a amazing thing that Planned Parenthood does um, that will cover your abortion. Um, so in terms of the contraception, uh, even if this horrendous bill is enacted, uh, that protection... I'm not sure what you said. <laughs> Siri is really into this. <laughs> um, that protection would continue under the CCCA. And actually, there's a... Um, so, so there's something also pending at the regulatory level around this. So a couple of months ago, uh, Governor Cuomo proposed two regulations around coverage for both contraception and abortion. Um, and it's worth noting that while we like regulations, we prefer laws because if the past few months have taught us anything, it's really easy to roll back a regulation and it's much more challenging to change a law. So while we love that Governor Cuomo was pro-choice, uh, if a new governor came in, they might be able to mess with it. Um, so Governor Cuomo proposed uh, allowing for uh, the no copay contraception uh, through the Department of Financial Services, which covers insurance law here, um, and also that 12-month procurement that Stacy was talking about, though. Uh, it's missing some key parts of what's in the CCCA and um, also includes a larger um, sort of like Hobby Lobby style exception for religious employers that we don't care for. So that's currently pending. A lot of organizations, I think possibly including NCJW, I guess, Aviva is nodding, so NCJW mm -hmm. did, uh, put forward comments on that regulation. The other uh, regulation that he proposed would allow for abortion coverage without copay, which is the would be the first in the country, I believe. And we have no idea where he came up with that. We'll take it. It's great. Um, and so we support that. And that, again, has more of a larger religious exception that we would like. Um, but in terms of, you know, there's a lot of things that the, the um, AHCA is scary for. You know, um, the bill includes that uh if a if a plan covers abortion that you couldn't get a federal subsidy for purchasing it but in new york state our essential health benefits mandate that most plans with the exception of a few that are out of um catholic health plans um have to cover abortion so that's going to create a real tension and i think that's something that experts right now are trying to figure out and i know that people i work like brilliant policy lawyer people that i work with are talking to folks in california and oregon and in all of these other states that are facing similar problems great thank you um rabbi kashdan there's a I've actually a few questions that are all sort of circling around i think people are surprised to hear that um, in Israel, abortion is actually in some ways easier to access than it is here in this country, um, because people think of the rabbinate in Israel as not so progressive, but more, you know, regressive on certain issues. Um, and so there's questions about like um, how how did this ha like how did this become how did this happen and how how pardon me? Hmm? I would think of following what, right. So, right. So, right. So, right. So, it's how, like, so, how, like, how do these tribunals happen, and um, and how did this become the law, and how easy is it to get, you know, to become approved for an abortion in Israel? Israel is a complex society. I'm not saying anything that anybody doesn't know here. Um, when it comes to health uh, in general. 
uh, Judaism has a very particular approach to health. And that is, you can do anything to save a life, pikuach nefesh, right? It's a guiding principle, uh, really, of Jewish bioethics. And, um, and so in the state of Israel, uh, there are certainly places uh, that are uh, deeply troublesome when you do have a uh, joining of synagogue and state. Uh, and there are also uh, some occasions where uh, the uh, theocracy, really, which is Israel, um, uh, is very much focused on, as you just said, uh, so correctly, the law. And if the Jewish law supports um, abortion in certain circumstances, um, then this would be what the state uh, mandate is as well. Now, I should say that in, in Israel, it is um, it is a both and when it comes to uh, the involvement of halakha, of Jewish law, in statewide decisions and policy. It's not uh, all the time. In fact, so much of what goes on in legislation in Israel is with that conflict of, uh, of bringing together uh, religion and um, religious practice as well as uh, that which uh, is thought to be um, in the best interest uh, public policy wise so there's there's certainly some tension there I'm not I'm not saying that it's all very simple but when it comes to abortion I, I would say this was the the guiding principle is actually uh, there's so much uh, fear-mongering I think in faith traditions in general it's certainly in Judaism uh, when it comes to the issue of abortion and even uh, Plenty of women who are exceptionally knowledgeable uh, really do think, and, and might even be taught, um, that abortion is uh, never allowed in Jewish tradition and is really an ultimate sin and is akin to uh, or tantamount to murder. Uh, that's very common. Uh, I certainly grew up and was a product of a school, of a schooling where that was taught. And it was only when I had access to Jewish text and Jewish knowledge that I was able to read the text myself um, and come to certain conclusions. Uh, to be honest, uh, one of the reasons that this exists in Israel is there are people who are quite knowledgeable. They're quite knowledgeable both uh, in religious law and also in civil law. Um, and, and really, this is an opportunity. This is a call for, for women to uh, take ownership of their bodies via access to Jewish education and Jewish text. Um, one of the reasons that Jewish learning is so important uh, if you are a person who is going to consider uh, Judaism, Jewish thought, Jewish philosophy in making some of these decisions, some of these healthcare decisions, and you might not be, but if you are, then having access to those texts in a way that you can access them yourself and you're not relying only on translation, which is always interpretation, uh, and this is, this is a really powerful thing. So... Uh, this is also a, a real call to, to hit the books. And uh, I think not only uh, from a Jewish perspective, not only Jewish texts, but in general, to know, uh, to know your rights and to, um, to, never, uh, to never just lay back and say, I'm not going to read the news today. I'm not going to follow. In, in, in fact, it's really a Jewish imperative to be very well versed in what's going on in the world around us uh, here in our own country uh, and also uh, to hold that uh, with Jewish knowledge as well. Um, th th there's a question here that maybe um, the, the, both Dr. Dillon and, 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 and Ellie, you might want to um, talk about, which is um, th there's th this tension between putting abortion rights in the context of health, like this, con this tension between women's health, is it, is it civil rights or is it health? And if you, if you, if you sort of call it um, a healthcare question, then like how does that impact like the civil rights? You know, like it, it should it be one versus the other? Is there one that's sort of more helpful um, that you find um, in terms of the, the work that you guys do? Start. <laughs> <laughs> I like that you're like uh, Nina, I need to um, that's a really interesting question and one that I have I uh, I think I think about and don't realize I think about it. Um, you know, I think of abortion access and reproductive rights in general in a few ways. I think um, in terms of the actual, like, delivery of services, I think of it as very firmly in the health sphere. And I think we need to destigmatize it and we need to talk about abortion as health care. I think it's often, like, you know, we hear about this in the way that it's, you know, these politicians who are debating 
our rights right now, the way they talk about it, it's very like abortion is this extra, it's this hidden thing, it's this dark thing. And I think it's important that we talk about the fact that, you know, there are different statistics, but as many as one in three women will have an abortion before she turns 45. It's like a huge amount and we just don't talk about it enough. Um, I think in terms of why it is so oppressed as a right is because because it's a it's women's right. You know, like I think it's it has to do with uh, a the oppression of women in general. It has to do with the distrust of women's sexuality and trying to control our sexuality and our bodies. Um, it, distrust of just gender expression in general and doing something that isn't like ladylike. You know, I think there's a lot of different factors at play. Um, so I think there's a lot of ways you can look at it. And then, you know, of course, with this reproductive justice framing, which Aviva talked about a little bit in her intro, I think it's also that we talk about it as an economic justice issue, I think is incredibly important because, you know, I'm a upper middle class white Jewish woman who lives in New York City. I will always be able to get an abortion. But the people who will not be able to get an abortion are the folks who are poor, who are brown and black, who live in rural areas. You know, those are, it, it's an economic justice issue. If you cannot control your body, you cannot control your destiny and your economic freedom. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the, the health versus the rights issue, you know, for all, for all the examples that I listed amongst, you know, women's lives in danger and families, that's not the bulk of the work that I do. The bulk of the work that I do is women who have made a decision for themselves that this is not the right time in their lives. Um, and uh, they, don't, they don't need um, a lot of reassurance or hand-holding. It's often not a difficult decision. It's just a decision that a, a woman has made and made very clearly for herself. And so um, my job as a physician is just to support a woman uh, on whatever she's whatever she's decided there, whether it's to provide continued prenatal care or to terminate a pregnancy. Um, that's what we're there for. And I, I really agree with all of the things you said. I think it's very much about control, and it's very much an economic issue. Um, disparities really, really exist based on people. Like that. So, and, and I just want to point out also <laughs> what, what should be obvious but doesn't seem to be, which is that um, a lot of times women aren't at the table in these conversations, right? So look what's happening with the Senate panel. There is not a single one. So the Senate, which is going to write its own, you know, version of the health care bill, has not a single woman on the committee, right? So like, how, who's going to talk about like the what the the prenatal care? I mean, you know, forget even the like the contraception and abortion pieces, like just like women's health care issues, you right? You know what menopause is, right? Right, <laughs> you right. Know, you know, what a is. So you know, so so, so it, it's also intermingled, you know. And then with um, as I was saying, like reproductive justice framework, because it's about like it's also about economics and who who has access, right? You know, and um, and Dr. Lynn, I don't know, like what your pay with the economic or geographic demographic, you know look of your patients are but you know I mean for people that have to even drive from Pennsylvania like that's it, it it's a hardship right so um, it, it's also so intermingled I'm, I'm cognizant of the time and one of the questions um, is what can we be doing what's the best way to support this work which is great because so there's a, there's a great debate in the Talmud um, which is the sixth century companion of rabbinic conversations for the first five six hundred years um, and some of the rabbis say what's more important is study more important or is action more important, right? You know, um, and in a, in a great sort of Jewish compromise, they say, well, both we have to study, which is what we've been doing here, because it leads to action. So, um, so we can't leave here by just like having learned, we actually have to do something. And Aviva is going to um, in, inspire us in our <laughs> actions that we're going to do tonight. Okay, so first of all, thank you so much to our amazing panel. Um, everyone uh, donated their time this evening to come and speak, so we really appreciate it. And we know that this is just the beginning of a much larger conversation, and I'm sure everyone's interest has been piqued by um, our speakers tonight. Um, a few more thank yous before we get to our action. I do want to thank the staff of NCJW New York, in particular Andrea Propel and Yael Reisman, for all their help in planning this event. Um, I want to thank Chelsea Garble. She wrote a beautiful um, piece for Jofa's blog um, in anticipation for 
this event and the entire advocacy leadership committee for all their help. Um, so, and again, thank you to Jofa for co-hosting, for live streaming it. Um, please follow Jofa on Facebook. They do a lot of great stuff online and um, follow them and follow NCGW New York, of course. Um, so now that we're armed with all this knowledge and fired up, so what can we do to uh, make a difference? So um, we have, as uh, Dr. DeWood mentioned, there are petitions you could sign for Planned Parenthood. We also have drafted letters. Um, it's four letters. We're going to give them out to everybody. Two of them are going to um, Senator um, Jeff Klein, the head of the IDC, who was mentioned uh, as a way of saying, we really need you to speak up and put pressure on your fellow senators um, to get bills passed. And two are going to um, Senator Flanagan, who is the majority leader and who has the power to bring the important legislature that we need to the floor. So two letters to each one in support of the RHA, the Reproductive Health Act, one in um, support of the CCCA, the Contraception Act. Um, and it's very easy to write your name in, top, and you sign the bottom with your address. There's space on the bottom if you want to add something personal, um, a message to um, any of these senators. I see some Riverdalians here. Senator Klein is our representative, so if you have a personal message to him, go ahead. And um, as was mentioned, we really think it's important to have these letters um, signed with, you know, the NCJW um, logo on there so that they know that Jewish women are for these. They cannot fall back on, you know, that religious groups don't support these acts and we need to be on the forefront of this issue. So yeah, I was going to hand those out and you could hand them back to myself and to Yael and we will give them to Senator Flanagan and Klein next week. Um, National Institute for Reproductive Health is having their lobby day. Co-sponsor with Physicians for Reproductive yes. Health. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we're going out to Albany to lobby for these two bills. There is room on the bus if anybody wants to sign up. It's a great day. You do have to get up early, but it's worth it. It's worth it. Um, and you'll get to meet with state legislatures. You'll get to lobby for these bills. Um, we really want to see both of these come to a vote before the end of the session, which is June 21st, right, I think, the state legislature ends. Um, so please consider doing and that. You can, go to, um, you can sign up at nirhealth.org. Um, if you do decide you want to come, if you could make that decision soon, that would be great as the person who is emailing the people <laughs> who are what going. Day, what day is it next week? It is uh, May 16th. It's a Tuesday. Uh, a week from today. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Um, and lastly, and very importantly, you could also get involved with NCJW through our Advocacy Leadership Committee. The ALC is a great way to get involved in supporting these initiatives, and we are always looking to grow and get more people involved. Um, in particular, we'd like to grow our reproductive justice work, and we need those who are passionate about the subject to get involved. Um, you have more information in your handouts on both of the, the bills that we're talking about, the CCCA and the RHA, as well as the ALC and what we do and how you can get involved. Um, so please sign the letters and give them back to us and have a great evening.